networking is actually very key. Some people might be asking, well, I'm kind of shy. I don't know how to reach out to people. What I'd say is this, start from a community that is closest to you. I know that every single person has their own significant circle of engagement or more or less their network uh, of, of people around. So you can always tap into other people's networks to actually get that connection that you're looking for. Hi everyone, I'm Tommy Odilami and I'm a, I'm a manager at a professional services firm. I came to Canada in 2018 to do my MBA. Prior to that, I was working at uh, one of the major companies back home in Nigeria. I've had a very different experience from an international student perspective being that I was more or less a more experienced student coming in. And I came in for an advanced degree as opposed to my first degree or you know, just right after my first degree coming in for a second degree. My journey so far has actually been really, really great and progressive in and of itself. Uh, coming into Canada, this wasn't my first time actually coming into Canada. My brother actually had come into Canada earlier. And so my journey was a little bit smoother than most, being that I had some level of support system coming in. Uh, one of the key things that uh, helped me actually settle here in Edmonton, Alberta, was one of my very, very good friends, Wally Agwola. We went to university together. And so when I was looking for schools, uh, he was one of the people that I reached out to. We spoke about what living like living in Edmonton was like. And uh, basically he gave me the highs and the lows or the highlights and the low lights. And, you know, using that as a yardstick with uh, school fees for the different uh, MBA programs, I was actually able to determine that the University of Alberta was one of the key places that I could actually go to uh, for my MBA. So landed in Edmonton, Wally actually came to come and pick me up from the airport. And coincidentally, he was my first landlord in Edmonton. So my journey has uh, actually been smooth from going through the MBA program. It did have its highs and its lows. You know, one of the things that happened was I basically quit my job one week before I actually resumed here in school. So my passport came out in, on Friday and by Saturday I was out of um, the location where I was working by Tuesday, I had hopped on a flight and I was in Edmonton on Wednesday. My first class was actually on Tuesday, so I missed the first class. Wednesday, immediately I landed, I went straight into my first class. And that's how I actually began my MBA journey here in Edmonton. One of the key highlights or key experiences that I had going through this program was during the summer break, looking for internships. Uh, a couple of the friends that I had formed people who had also come from Nigeria for their advanced degrees, we were finding it a little bit more challenging finding internship opportunities. We had worked with the career services at uh, the University of Alberta to actually help us tailor our resumes and our experiences so that organizations could see how they actually applied to their own context. But we were finding it very, very difficult. A lot of the people in our classes had gotten internships as far back as you know December of the year before and fast forward a couple of months this was march april no internships were coming up and you know times are getting desperate because from a timeline perspective more often than not if by march april you haven't gotten an internship it's pretty much more or less a dicey situation before you can actually get one so come april uh may no internships yet i reached out to a couple of people in uh, my church community and i was actually referred to uh, refer for a job. It was more or less a hands-on laborer job to support shooting uh, 5G cables to houses and then basically, uh, you know, standing up those cables on the houses. I'm not even going to lie. It's, uh, it was a very, very labor intensive job. So I did that job for five days and by the fifth day, I was ready to quit. Uh, on that fifth day, that fateful day, we were on our way to a particular site when I got a call from one of the companies that I had already applied to and I was told that they were trying to negotiate like an increase in uh, the offer for me. So basically I got that call. I was about to start a job in Calgary. That day I quit that job. Uh, and by the next week I was in Calgary for my internship. So by and large, my experiences have actually been largely positive just thanks to the community that I had coming into Edmonton thanks to the support system of family, of friends, uh, and largely also thanks to the support of the church and you know, the career center at the MBA program.
So my journey to the MBA started while I was working back home in Nigeria. I was working for one of those organizations that I actually had mentioned earlier, and we were running a manufacturing transformation project. Uh, it, during that project, I was opportune to work in a particular people-facing role, and it was there that I realized that I, I actually enjoyed it, and I was trying to like find experiences or find something that could help me you know, pivot into that particular line of business. Uh, so, you know, doing my research, I had looked uh, at a couple of things. Even prior to that, I think this memory is actually very significant. So before then, right after my first degree, I was on the verge of applying for a PhD program. Uh, something happened. I was filling out the form, and then there was a line that said, what new knowledge are you looking to add to the body of mechanical engineering? I blanked at that question, and it was there and then that I thought to myself, I can't actually put five years on the line. And after that five years, I come out either being, you know, more qualified than entry level jobs or having no experience that you know higher level jobs would not actually be able to you know employ me and so i transitioned i thought about it i was like okay so i'm gonna actually apply for a master's degree i had initially applied for a master's degree in mechanical engineering but then i had decided to stay back a little bit uh back home to more or less let's say do entrepreneurship but ask the people who are from nigeria lagos in particular if you try to show Lagos, Lagos would show you. And no kidding, Lagos showed me, and I decided to get a job instead. So getting that job basically shifted or pivoted my path, my path away from you know wanting to do a master's in engineering. And then after that experience with the people facing side of things, I actually had that switch to decide to do an MBA. So now deciding which school to go to was pretty much more or less a numbers game, right? My brother was in Toronto. I had looked at the U of T. Uh, I looked at University of Victoria, I had looked at, you know, McGill, I had looked at a number of universities across Canada and I had ranked them based off of reputation, based off of cost. And I kid you not, the University of Alberta was pretty much the most cost effective. Also compared with the other provinces, Alberta had the lowest taxes. And I'm telling you, you want to keep as much of your dollars as you can when it comes to a living situation, right? Even from a cost of living perspective, Edmonton was actually a very, very considerably um, chip city, if I should say, right? So it was really, really good on the pocket. So that's how I actually ended up deciding to come to the University of Alberta to do my MBA. Again, thinking through if I should do a master's in management or if I should do an MBA. For me, I was looking to pivot, that is move away from, you know, core engineering, right? Core engineering, tools on hand, boots on ground, to transition more into a people-facing role because I thought about it, if you want if you want to move up as a mechanical engineer, as an engineer in any place, you don't have to wait for the person above you to retire, get fired, or decide you want to do anything else with your life. Because it's more or less a pyramid structure. So I decided to take that other way out, which is basically taking a master's degree or sorry, a, an MBA degree. Uh, that way, it gives me some level of management experience. So if I'm if I'm looking to pivot back into the engineering industry, I already have some management experience or soft skills that are really not that easy to obtain, except you spend a lot of time um, managing people. And that's basically where my mindset was in trying to decide between, you know, an MBA and a master's degree in mechanical engineering or a master's in engineering management or a master's in management in and of itself. Um, during my MBA, I feel like the key, some of the key highlights during my MBA program were the other international students that I got the opportunity to actually interact with. Chief among them were the Indian students. So there is quite a significant, um, you know, population of Indian students in my MBA program. They're actually quite represented. Same with the Nigerians. And looking at culture, I guess our similarities between like both cultures starts from rice. Uh, and then from rice, it, it expands into spices and color and culture, you know, food and community. So it was, it was actually quite similar and, you know, I was able to bond with them. I made quite a number of friends there. Um, I was opportune to actually serve on the MBA association as, first of all, a first year rep, and then subsequently as a vice president for you know external affairs or people, culture, and, and, and communication. So that experience gave me the opportunity to interact with my fellow students, to help organize festivals or events that celebrated you know, the diversity that we had from a cultural perspective or a nationality perspective in in uh, in the MBA program. One of the key events that I actually did remember was, uh, you know, the Festival of Lights, I think it was Diwali, also the Festival of Colors. 
um, with the Indian students. So that was actually a really, really great opportunity, you know, to get exposed to a different culture and understand how the similarities and differences between both cultures uh, actually played out. And until now, I still have some of them as very, very close friends. You know, we still, you know, catch up once in a while. They're working at other firms here in Edmonton. Some have actually moved out to Toronto, some to Vancouver. And, you know, on the off chance, we actually end up seeing each other at functions or, you know, at the conferences where our organizations send us to. So having those connections built during the MBA program, they actually go a long way um, after the program. And, you know, right now, I'd say some of these people are people that I can actually reach out to. They are part of my network. So I, I do, re I remember, I think there was someone in my, in my network that was looking for an opportunity and I was able to reach out to someone else in my network who was able to assist that person. So again, this just ties back to the importance of like forming that network during, you know, your degree. Don't just isolate yourself or, you know, stick to the one community that you're comfortable with. Like, have a breadth of, of, you know, of connections. So it, it increases the diversity of your experience. It enriches it and actually makes it more colorful. So as someone who has actually traveled a lot, coming into Edmonton, Alberta, from a culture shock perspective, it wasn't actually that huge. Uh, I'd say I've experienced winter before, but <laughs> Edmonton winter, it's in a league of its own, right? It's in a completely different league of its own. The first day the temperatures hit minus 40 and people were still going about their normal days at schools were still open. I was actually shocked. Like, how can people survive in this place, this condition? There's winter and then there's Edmonton. That's like a different season in and of itself. So for me, that was probably one of like the, the biggest shocks that I actually experienced here, just the how extreme uh, temperature differences were here in Edmonton. Even going into summer, temperatures were going as high as 40 degrees. Like, I kid you not, like, that huge difference in temperature, it's about 100 degrees on the, on the temperature scale in terms of temperature difference. It's, it's such a huge difference, such that it, it, it has its own effect on your body, right? I think, oh yeah, another thing that was probably, from a culture shock perspective, was um, living in the basement. And not just living in the basement, but living in the basement in winter, it's a completely different thing. It's colder, it's more depressing. You're looking out the window, your window is covered with snow. You go out, you shovel the snow so you can get some daylight. By the next day, if it snows again, you're completely shut in. So yes, there are some elements of uh, mental stress when you're living in that kind of situation. But again, when you're supported or surrounded by a, a very vibrant community, uh, myself as someone who's really outgoing, I'd actually go out of my way. Yes, I'd trudge through the snow, you know, trudge into the snow, literally uh, to, to, to find that community of people that I can actually start to bond with. Uh, one of the things I like to do was to organize like games nights and then just have people over. Um, over the COVID period, I started cooking more often than I usually do. And I started something called, uh, I think it was COVID Chef. It was just literally something I just post on Instagram. But aside from that, it was literally just to bring people in. And you know, one of the central themes of my culture, uh, our, my culture revolves around food, it revolves around people. So bringing people together, that was actually such a good experience to actually help deal with that culture shock. Um. Um, in transitioning from the MBA program into the workforce, I guess it started from my work experience back home. I was working for an international organization so that whole difference in, you know, calling people by their first names, it, it wasn't really a thing for me when I got here, just because where I was working before, it was, it was a policy. It was like a standard policy. So it took me a while to get used to it back home. But then coming in here, that transition, it really didn't take me long to actually, like, you know, move into it. Because again, as people introduce themselves to you, that's how you actually then, you know, address them by. And here, identity is more or less on an individual basis. Uh, compared to back home where it's more of a communal basis. So here, whatever people choose to identify as is actually how you identify them. So, you know, my work experience um, back home, uh, I worked with uh, in oil and gas. I worked in fast moving consumer goods. Uh, I worked in manufacturing. So bringing that experience here, it actually helped me with my internship. So in July of 2000 and 
2019 or June, July of 2019, I was privileged to actually get an internship with one of the uh, midstream oil and gas companies in Calgary. Uh, basically, they supply line pipes to oil and gas companies. So it was actually very, very good for me taking my experience working in oil and gas, both midstream and downstream, you know, being able to translate that experience here into a different market, but pretty much more or less the same industry. So it actually helped me uh, integrate easily into, you know, that organization during my internship. And the learning curve was, I'd say it wasn't that steep. Again, just because working for an international organization prior to coming here, pretty much maintained more or less the same standard of working from a, a work culture perspective. I know driving to results as opposed to, you know, maybe being focused on something else. Um, my internship experience also helped contribute to, you know, my ability to integrate easily uh, after graduation into my full time uh, job. But before I go into how that integration happened, probably I just want to dial back a little bit and talk about how I actually got my full time job. So one of the key things here in Canada is understanding how to network properly and how to you know, utilize your network to actually find inroads in whatever it is you want to do, be it volunteering, be it full-time work, be it even just being part of something. So here at uh, the University of Alberta, in one of those many uh, student groups that were actually always just popping up here and there were student activities, I was privileged to be invited to one. It was like a consulting networking night. And then uh, I met a couple of people from a particular consulting organization. And being in that space, they seemed to be the only people who were enjoying the work that they were doing because, you know, they appeared lively. And this was like at the close of work. So I struck up a conversation with them. You know, I reached out to one of them after the fact and then asked to actually have a coffee with them. So one of the key things about being here in Canada is more often than not, people are available if they can actually sit down over a cup of coffee it's like the the first introduction to building a long-lasting relationship right a cup of coffee is such a way that it, it it levels the playing field and then it gives you that opportunity to have a personable conversation with the person sitting right next to you so i was privileged to have a cup of coffee with um, one of the people that i met that night and you know apparently it made such a lasting impression because fast forward a year after right after my internship, when it was time to begin applying for a full-time job, um, I kind of saw a summer social, a summer networking event that was organized by one of these companies that I was eyeing as at that time. And then I went, I, I applied, I got selected, and then I went for that program. On stepping into, that, uh, into the organization that day, the person that I had a coffee with about a year ago uh, instantly recognized me, said hi, took me by my hand, and you know, took me around the room, introducing me to every single person saying, oh, yeah, this is the person that I told you about about a year ago. So, again, I believe, again, the, the impressions you make or the connections you make, uh, it doesn't matter how far back it is. They would always come back, you know, later on in the future to, you know, pay dividends. So that way I was pretty much more or less integrated with the team before I actually even got in. And then I was helped throughout the, the you know, the application process, even when I got into you know, the whole process of, of interviewing and all the way up to the the approval stage, it was pretty much more or less a seamless journey for me. And so I ended up getting a full-time job one year before I graduated. And so, you know, th those are the kind of things that you you want to think about, especially as an international student, um, just trying to fend for yourself or find your way in, in, this, in this, you know, city or in this land. Networking is actually very key. Some people might be asking, well, I'm kind of shy. I don't know how to reach out to people. What I'd say is this, start from the community that is closest to you. I know that every single person has their own significant circle of engagement, or more or less their network uh, of, of people around. So you can always tap into other people's networks to actually get that connection that you're looking for. So everyone's journey is different, right? Everyone's experience is different. Coming to Canada, I found that, you know, Black Canadians, how they feel, um, especially from a racial perspective, or when they deal with racial issues, is actually largely different from how, you know, Nigerian international students or international students in general uh, feel about these things or experience these things. Um, it's also different from international students to international students. For example, myself coming in as a more you know, mature or experienced international student. I already had a you 
know, well-rounded or formed identity about who I was and I was comfortable in my skin. Also, because I've had, I have had the opportunity of, you know, interacting with people who look like me, they sound like me, and I've done this for a long time, I've been immersed in this, I had already developed a very strong sense of who I was. And it didn't really matter what anybody, you know, said or did. It, it really didn't make me feel any less than who I was or what I was. So I guess the advice that I would give to international students and also their parents is to help their, you know, their children understand who they are, develop a strong understanding of who you are as a human being, who you are as a black person, understand that you have every right to be here. You have a place here and, you know, no one can make you feel like you're out of place here. Why? Because you, as well as anybody else, deserves to be where you are. So it's part of the things that would help you navigate, you know, those little, little micro racial aggressions that come your way. Some of them might be people asking, oh, wow, you speak really good English. Where are you from? It takes a little bit to just educate such a person. You don't necessarily have to approach it in such a way as, you know, receive it as an aggression. You can just, you know, have a conversation with the person about understanding that, well, the world is a big place and English is actually the official language of a lot of places. That way, especially if you're in an organizational setting or an institutionalized setting, it tends to help reduce that. And if it does keep coming your way, you know what? You can continue to educate these people. If they choose to be unreasonable about it, you can have a firm conversation with people about this. But then it takes you having a strong sense of identity. And largely, this can be built up prior to you coming here. It's one of the things that you, know, you start to think about, that you can start to imbibe in yourself. And parents, you can also start to imbibe in your children as to you know, that strong sense of you know, they're humans, they're, they're loved, they're amazing and they can do more, and even above what others can do. They have ability, they have capacity, they are not less. And nothing anybody says would actually affect them. Yes, I'm not saying that you will not face, you know, seasons of questioning yourself or, you know, imposter syndrome when you enter into a new space, but being comfortable in your skin would give you that extra step to rise, you know, above that, uh, initial imposter syndrome, such that when people start to, you know, question your ability, you know what you can do and you know what you're able to do and you would set out to do that irrespective of what anybody else says. Another thing that can help, especially coming into this country, is, you know, finding that community. And I know a lot of people talk about community and network, but finding that community that would, you know, continue to help build up your identity. I will continue to affect your identity myself as a christian take my identity from from the bible you know i know who i am in christ but then even outside of that surrounding myself with a community of like-minded people who continues to affirm my identity and you know continues to help build those deep roots of who i am actually helps play a huge part in you know being able to face the daily challenges that come my way from a you know questioning my ability perspective or questioning my experiences, perspective, or, you know, downplaying what exactly it is that I'm going through on a daily basis, either from microaggressions or direct impacts of, you know, racial issues. So by and large, these things, I, I believe, would actually help prepare both parents and their children for, you know, facing these kind of issues. And, you know, you would always find safe places to talk about these things, to air, you know, your grievances, to vent especially in that community of like-minded people. So definitely it's worth looking for such a community. Um, you know, transitioning from an international student to an international worker and then now to a permanent resident. Yes, I've been here for about five years. COVID basically delayed my whole transition from an international worker to a permanent resident. But that being said, challenges would come your way. Um, just know that at the end of the day, none of them can st stand the test of time. So it's been a very great experience for me to, to share my story and also to listen to other people's stories uh, as they've been sharing them. Because again, everyone is going through something. You don't know what they're going through. On the outside, it seems like everything is rosy. But again, opportunities like this, platforms like this, gives us all the opportunity to hear each other's stories, to share those stories, to empathize with each other and to understand that we're not in this alone, right? 
that's the one key thing that you should understand. You're not in this alone. Um, everybody out there is going through something. If you're willing and you're open, there are people who are willing to listen, to share with you, to empathize with you, to comfort you, and you know, to hold your hand as you're going through this journey. So understand this, there are people who have gone ahead of you who are trying and working their best to pave the way for you so that your experience will not be as you know, lonesome as theirs was. So having that in mind, you can always reach out to people, right? Everyone is literally one coffee away. All you just have to do is reach out on LinkedIn, reach out through your networks, reach out through any other platform that you have, you know, access to. And believe you me, I don't know about anybody else, but yes, people in this community are literally one coffee away, right? Or one jello fries away. It doesn't really matter, but either one of the two would work. So in essence, you know, there is opportunity here. I'm not saying that there are no challenges or drawbacks. Yes, they do exist. It'll be, you know, callous of me to, you know, use my experience as a benchmark and say, oh, this is how it's going to be for everyone. But what I would say is there does exist an opportunity. And again, it is how you look at the glass. You can either look at it as half empty or half full. You can either, you know, take advantage of, you know, your community to help energize you and strengthen you. Yes, there are institutional obstacles in your way, but I tell you this, you can actually surmount it. I use myself as an example, you know, starting from struggling to find an internship position, you know, to right now, you know, being a manager in one of the top professional services firms in, you know, Canada. Um, what I find is I, I basically use this opportunity and this, this position that I'm in to actually help support others in the community because, again, it's very clear that representation does matter, right? So seeing people in the spaces that I'm in, I do believe inspires others to you know, aspire to be better, to be greater, that it is actually possible to achieve the things that you're trying to achieve. So honestly, go out there, you know, go for it, go for the goal, keep chasing after it, network with people in those spaces that you're looking for. And if you don't see anyone in those spaces, reach out to people in other spaces that you know that you have affinity with, and definitely they can help coach you, guide you, mentor you. They can be your advocate, they can be your sponsor, not from a financial perspective, but then being able to speak your name behind closed doors. Right. So those are the kind of things that you would want to see, uh, you know, happen. Take advantage of the opportunities that come your way. Right. Make sure that your friendships are friendships that, you know, they you, they they add value to your life. Right. My friendship with Wally has added a lot of value to my life. But I would say, um, you know, from the investments in real estate and all of that fun stuff. You know, right now, over in the space of what, three, four five years, by the grace of God, with the support of friends, with you know, great advice, uh, and from a financial perspective also, being able to delay gratification, right? Uh, before I even get to the end of this, but being able to delay gratification goes a very, very long way. You know, eat out less. Try to cook more. It saves you money in the long run. Don't, don't try to get the good things now, right? Don't go for the iPhone 15 Pro Max right now, right? Don't go for the latest Air Force Ones right now, right? You can always defer material satisfaction until later on. Why? Because, yes, it sounds like you're saving those little things. It doesn't add up too much. But in the long run, it actually does. Over the span of three years, you'll be able to, you know, accumulate and build up enough financial strength or acumen or muscle to be able to then start to afford the things that would actually pay you back. For example... I understood what this looked like and, you know, being frugal, being financially responsible. Um, I've been able to, you know, buy a car. That took actually a long while uh, because a lot of people were begging me to buy a car. I started off walking everywhere because, you know what, why not? Then I bought a bicycle. I was riding and cycling everywhere. And, you know, people kept making comments. But that didn't phase me because, again, there's always an end goal in mind. And now I bought a car. Um, living in basements here and there. Uh, not living rough, I should say, but, you know, just being very mindful of 
how much it is that I'm putting towards uh, expenses like that. I wasn't looking to live in, you know, those high rise buildings on the 14th floor. Um, I was comfortable living on the first floor. But thankfully, now, after all these years, I've been able to afford my own house. So those are the kind of things that you want to start to look at. You know, there's an end goal for everything, right? Yes, as a student right now, you might not be thinking about that. But then there are little, little drops of water that you can put into, you know, your space to make that mighty ocean that would eventually pay off at the end of the day, right? So all these things are achievable. And to the parents of international students, I'll say this. Understand that for your child, they're going through multiple phases at the same time. Some of them are just leaving home for the first time. Some of them are just fending for themselves for the first time. Some of them are just getting to the understanding of being of understanding how to manage their finances for the first time, getting into a different school system for the first time, getting into a space whereby their skin color is very, very distinct and it stands out for the first time. Right? So all of these things are constantly you know, crowding the mind of your child. So I'd advise to give space, right? Give space, give love, show empathy, understand that your child needs your support more than anything at this point in time. They might not say it, but the more you're able to show them love and support, the more it goes a long way in helping them from a mental health perspective, um, understand which communities that they can look at to support them, and try and build networks in those communities just so that, you know, at some point in time, you have people who would be willing to look out for, you know, your words or your child's interest. Those, those things are kind of key things to, to, you know, start to look at, you know. And, you know, constantly pray for your children, advise them, even when they don't take it. Trust me, it actually lands very well. And I say whenever you can, come and see your children, uh, take pictures with them, make videos with them. It creates very, very good memories for those times when, you know, you're not there. They can always go back, look at those pictures, look at those memories. And in the cold dead of the winter nights, it gives them the summer and spring warmth of joy, right?